Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kay Domrat. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the BMFA. Um, thank you for joining us today for our May 3 and 30. Um, today, it is my pleasure to welcome Madeline Dugan, the BMFA Curatorial Assistant, and she is the curator of a current exhibition we have up called Producing the Picturesque Watercolors and Collaborative Prints by Kwasi Hasui, and she's going to be talking a little bit about some of the works in this exhibition today. So with that, I will pass it off to you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Katie. So first, I just want to start um, by saying happy Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, and I would like to extend a thank you to Li Jin, our fantastic E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter, Curator of East Asian Art, for her incredible mentorship and supervision of my curation of this exhibition. For today's 3 and 30, I really wanted to focus on the collaborative process of woodblock printing. So before I begin with our specific works, I'll start with some background on woodblock prints themselves. Woodblock prints have been used in Japan since the 8th century, though their popularity really soared during the Edo period, which dates from about 1615 to 1868. This was a period of peace and prosperity for Japan. The leading Tokugawa shogunate moved the center of Japan from Kyoto to the city of Edo, now known as Tokyo, which gave the Edo period its name. This prosperous time led to rapid urbanization, the emergence of a middle class, and the flourishing of the visual, literary, and performing arts. Woodblock prints were easily affordable to this new middle class, and the art form thrived with a large market, changing to appeal to different tastes by depicting popular culture like well-known kabuki actors, landscapes, and most popularly, images of Edo's pleasure quarters. These prints were called ukiyo-e prints, which translates to pictures of the floating world. And the character to float came to stand for transitory, expressing the ephemeral nature of the pleasure quarters where people indulged in their dreams and desires. The popularity of these prints really peaked during the 18th century, but the later half of the 19th century after the Meiji Restoration in 1868, when Japan opened its borders to the outside world for the first time, um, ukiyo-e prints were eventually overlooked in favor of the new technology pouring into the country, especially photography and mechanical printing techniques. By the 20th century, ukiyo-e was mainly a market for Western audiences who were interested in an art form that was fairly foreign to Europeans and Americans. In Japan, ukiyo-e had lost its foothold, and this is where Watanabe Shozaburo comes in. Now, Watanabe wasn't an artist, he was a businessman, though he certainly appreciated art. He originally worked as an ukiyo-e dealer for Bunshichi Kobayashi, exporting prints overseas to Western audiences. And disheartened by the lack of appreciation for woodblock prints within Japan itself, Watanabe sought to improve both the quality of prints as well as their status in Japan. So at just 24 years old, he established his own store, which you see a picture of here, Watanabe Print Shop. And instead of trying to replicate the traditional style of ukiyo-e, Watanabe wanted to combine the historic techniques with new modern imagery. Watanabe called these woodblock prints um, shinhanga, which means new prints. His first works were with Austrian painter Franz Capillari, whose watercolor landscape paintings worked really well with the woodblock medium, and later British painters Charles W. Bartlett and Elizabeth Keith. Watanabe then commissioned Japanese painter Goyo Hashiguchi to produce designs as well. And Watanabe would go to different exhibitions and scout for talented painters, especially students of the painter Kiyokata Kaburagi, who um, it looked like their work would translate well to the woodblock medium. He especially enjoyed the work of Ito Shinsui, 
who began working when Shinsui was just 18. In 1912, a student of Kiyokata Kaburagi named Kawase Hasui saw the Shinhanga exhibition, Eight Views of Oni by Ito Shinsui, uh, published by Watanabe, and Hasui was immediately inspired. Originally born with the name Kawase Bunjiro, after two years learning traditional Japanese painting under his teacher Kiyokata, Kiyokata gave him the artist's name Hasui. The same year Hasui saw Shinsui's exhibition, he partnered with Watanabe and produced his first wood woodlocks, Shiobara Trilogy. And from then on, the two worked with each other for the rest of their careers. Hasui actually frequently sketched uh, Watanabe's grandson, Masao, and we own a beautiful yet heartbreaking scroll paint, uh, painting that Hasui made for Watanabe after Masao's premature death when he was a toddler. Shinsui called Hasui a traveling poet because Watanabe encouraged Hasui to travel all over Japan on sketching trips where Hasui would sketch landscapes and later come home to create more refined watercolors to use as designs for woodblocks. And we are incredibly fortunate at VMFA to own 16 of Hasui's original watercolors, which were generously given to us by Renee and Carolyn Balser. So unlike with Western woodblock making where the artist creates the design, carves the woodblock themselves, and ultimately chooses what the finished product looks like, Japanese woodblock making is fairly different. Japanese woodblock making has four parties included. You have the Eishi, who is the artist, so in this case, Hasui, the Horishi, or block cutter, who cuts the woodblocks, the Surishi, or printer, who inks the blocks and prints them onto the paper, and then all three of these individuals collaborate under the direction of the Hanmoto, or publisher, who in our exhibition focuses on Watanabe Shozaburo. So to start the process, Hasui would make sketches from studying landscapes in plein air, and the publisher would look through these sketches and pick the one he thought would look best in a woodblock. In this example, the publisher is actually Kawaguchi and Saki, but more often than not, Hasui worked with Watanabe. With the publisher's choice, Hasui would then paint an original watercolor design. So you see an example of this on the far left. The publisher, the block cutter, and Hasui would meet and discuss composition, after which Hasui might tweak some elements. And then Hasui would trace the outline onto multiple pieces of paper, and each piece would have different spaces colored in to indicate where the woodblock carver should carve and leave raised on each individual woodblock. Hasui would give the outlines to the block cutter, who would then rice paste the drawing face down on the woodblock from a cherry tree after it died, dried, and the paper would be peeled off revealing the ink still on the surface of the wood. Then they would begin to carve, and this process would be done to however many blocks the print necessitated. This middle print is called a key block. It's the first print made from the first wood block in the process, and it would serve as an outline for the remaining blocks. You can see on the right-hand side, there are two marks in the right bottom corner, as well as the upper right side, and this is the key. And this was especially helpful for the printers so that they could get a print with the lines, within the lines each time. Here's another example of a key block by a different artist. And you can see that the key is actually raised here on the wood block. And this would tell the printer where to put the paper so that the piece lined up perfectly every time a new block was placed on the print. So on this next box for the same design, we see the key again, so the images line up. And on the right, we see a sample print of what the block's color was used for. So different blocks were carved to cover different areas of the print with color. 
And there are a lot of intricacies in this process between steps, so I encourage everyone to watch A Life in Prince, Kawase Hasui, filmed in 1955 by Watanabe Tadasu, which films Hasui and the craftsmen going through the process step by step with narration. And it's on YouTube in English in full for you to watch. The printer would take sumi ink and spread it onto the wood block, which he would place moistened paper on top of to absorb the ink. And then he would take a baron and rub with pressure onto the paper to get the ink firmly imprinted on the paper. And this would be repeated with each color until the finished image was created. And here's a diagram that just gives a little bit more full view of the step-by-step -step of colors. Um, so you see Hokusai's Great Wave off Kanagawa, which would have taken eight wood blocks to print the full picture. And during the printing process, different colors and hues would be experimented with and given to the publisher for approval. So he would ultimately design what color schemes would sell best to the public. And of course, the last part would be to print seals onto the wood block so you knew who the publisher and artist were. The final thing I would like to note before jumping into our works today is how to spot whether a work is a watercolor or a woodblock piece. So this is a watercolor by Hasui, and his watercolors are distinguishable by his square or rectangular stamps like this one. And then this next image is a woodblock, which you can gauge from Hasui's circular seal. And this is Watanabe Shozaburo's seal, which you um, which would go on any prints that were published by him. So when you see the show in person, before you read the label, try and look and see if you can tell what's a watercolor and what's a print, apart from not just the stylistic differences between mediums, but also through the stamps. So, Here's the first print of our three works today. This is Ayama in Iyo, which is in the Kanagawa prefecture of Japan. On the left here, we see the first rough wa watercolor for the composition, currently in the Balsers collection, next to the more finished watercolor of the scene, which is currently up in our galleries. So you can see the original watercolor sketch is a wider view of the scene and it presents a more calm, though still kind of dreary sky. It's much more naturalistic than the one on the right. And the second watercolor is cropped and ready to be a woodblock print. The colors feel like they're sectioned out in specific shapes, almost cartoon-esque, like you would see carved on a print. There's also the addition of a rope anchoring the boat to shore. The sailboat has moved in the background from the original watercolor, and now the sky is full of ominous clouds. Here is the ladder watercolor paired with the ladder woodblock print. If you take a second to really compare the two, you'll notice that there are a lot of changes that were made to create the result. The colors in the painting in the print have lightened significantly, still keeping the stormy atmosphere, but making it easier to see. The woodblock print has made the water much more reflective, creating this really beautiful rippling effect that's much more distinct than the original watercolor. The composition itself has been cropped in, shifting the position of the main boat closer to our focus. The large island in the background has been shifted from the middle all the way to the right, reducing the amount of overlapping lines for the woodblock carver to carve, as well as making the image feel like it's more visually spread out. There's more to attract our eye to different places here than with the watercolor, where the boat and rock are on top of each other and there's only one sight line. Because the giant rock has shifted, the sailboat in the background has actually shifted back to the left side of the island, like in the original rough watercolor sketch. 
And in the boat, the female figure on the left has been shifted down inside the boat to stand eye level with her male counterpart. This print has been analyzed as a wife either saying goodbye to her, her husband before he sets out into the storm or greeting him as he has arrived back home right before a downpour. You may notice that this print doesn't have uh, Watanabe's seal on it, and that's because it's a trial print or a Watanabe edition. So this print was printed as a proof after which Watanabe and Hasui and the printer would come together and decide if they liked the result. Evidently, the clouds were too dreary as the final prints were created without them. These final prints were printed with varying hues of pink and orange, and it was pretty typical for Watanabe to create two different color variations in order to appeal to more people. Our second print is Setakamui Rock Shiribishi, which is in the Hokkaido prefecture in Japan. This is the original watercolor along with the resulting print. And it actually looks like it's a pretty faithful print compared to the original sketch, though there are still some significant changes that were made in the resulting woodblock. First, we can see the composition has been cropped in to focus more on the rock itself instead of the ocean along with it. Again, the resulting print is more cartooned than the more naturalistic watercolor with less detailing of the rocks and significantly less moss on the rocks. The skyline has dropped a bit and there are more rocks added into the print, which are actually there at Setakamui Rock in real life, but just aren't present in the watercolor. And this allows for more movement or action to happen with waves crashing against those rocks instead of the calm water in the watercolor. And this has been done to the rest of the water as well. Instead of the gentle ripples approaching the shore, the crests of active waves have a curling foamy effect which is reminiscent of the foam of the famous great wave off Kanagawa by Hokusai. The rocks are also less dense in the right-hand corner, leaving it up to the viewer to assume that they're technically there. And finally, the clouds in the upper left-hand corner have been shifted at an angle that follows the crest of the rock slope. And as with Ayama and Io, this print also came with a pink color variant. I believe um, Watanabe said that the pink toned prints would sell better in the West. For our final print, we have a view of Mount Unzen from Amakusa, which is in the Kumamoto prefecture. Asui said at some point in his career, he learned to see the landscapes in front of him as woodblocks, which resulted in paintings that needed little to no change between the watercolors and prints. Here we see that very thing. There's very little change other than the shadow being a little more cartooned in the woodblock for the clouds and grasses and more stylized reflection under the sailboat in the background. Some colors have been adjusted to convey dirt a little bit more clearly, like the purplish ground in the fields, as well as the road that the man walks with his donkey on. This might in part be due to the fact that Hasui had already made the scene into a woodblock before. The image on the right is a woodblock Hasui and Watanabe had made in 1922. On September 1st, 1923, Japan experienced the Great Kanto earthquake, which wreaked havoc over Tokyo and other prefectures in the Kanto region. The earthquake only damaged Watanabe's shop slightly, but the fire that it caused unfortunately destroyed the woodblocks and prints inside of the building. The earthquake also destroyed Hasui's dozens of travel sketchbooks, 
So after the dust settled, Watanabe encouraged Hasui to go on a sketching trip. And this not only helped Hasui uh, cheer up, but it also got him to sketch plenty of new woodblock designs. So because this earlier print was made in 1922, right before the earthquake, the woodblocks for it were most likely destroyed in the fire. Watanabe might have encouraged Hasui to revisit popular selling prints from the past in order to produce more versions quickly. So here in this 1937 print, we have Hasui revisiting the scene from 1922. It's an extremely cropped in version, as you can see, focusing on the man and his donkey with the mountain's peak instead of the zoomed out expanse of the field. Hasui held the record for producing the largest number of prints by any artist using modern traditional woodblock techniques over his 40 year career as a printmaker. In 1957, for his accomplishments in his artistic output, the Japanese government honored Hasui with the title of Living National Treasure. Two years later, in 1959, Watanabe was awarded the Medal for Cultural Merit, and in 2003, Watanabe was also posthumously awarded a purple ribbon for his success in preserving, studying, and disseminating traditional ukiyo-e prints as well as for keeping the traditional medium alive through Shinhanga. Through their several decade long career, Hasui and Watanabe made woodblocks more accessible to an international audience and revived Japan's appreciation and desire for this artistic um, historic art form. So thank you everyone for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Marilyn, that was so great.